Yeah. One sec. Are you? I. I'm just gonna do a quick sound check. Uh, hi, Zoom participants. I just want to make sure that you can hear us. Good. Okay. Hi, everyone. We're going to get started. Thanks for your patience. Uh, this building is really complicated to find, so we normally just start a little bit later to give folks some time to find it. But my name is Sam. I'm a PhD candidate at the Women and Gender Studies Institute in collaboration with Sexual Diversity Studies. Uh, welcome to Sex Salon. For those of you that don't know about Sex Salon, we are a monthly graduate student speaker series sponsored by the Marcus Bonham for Sexual Diversity Studies. Uh, it's organized uh, by graduate students in sexual diversity studies. So thank you, Jad, for organizing this month's event and taking all the lead on logistics. Um, and yeah, so we still have two more events this year. We have one at the end of April and at the end of May. Our event is always Wednesdays, the last Wednesdays of the month, 6 o'clock to 8 p.m. Um, and there's lots of opportunities to get involved with organizing um, with Sex Salon. So we welcome you know, people who want to be involved with it um, to do that labor and <laughs> and make these things happen across the university. Um, for those who don't know this building, there's two gendered bathrooms down the hall. Um, and we're probably going to take like a 10 minute break after the talk or like a five minute break to give people a little bit rest. And then we'll go into the Q&A after. You can also just yeah step out to the bathroom. Um, but I'm going to pass it off to Sam to do um, more introductions. But yeah, welcome, everyone. Hey, hi everyone. Welcome today. Uh, Sam, do you mind like pulling the door open the tiniest bit? Yeah, just to be like, yeah, we're welcoming. I don't know. So I'm here to do double duty for the land acknowledgement and to introduce Chris. But let's start with the land acknowledgement. Hello, Zoom World people. Well, great. Okay. Land acknowledgement. I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, it's the meeting place, and this today's meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. This name was developed in consultation with First Nation Cross and the Elder Circle, some scholars in the field, and senior university officials. That's my favorite part and senior university officials. Um, great, wonderful. Of course, I want to say more about land acknowledgement because I'm gonna take it from your time. This past week, story time mode. This past week, I heard two other land acknowledgements that made me reconsider a bit what I wanted to say here. First, Professor Naveen Minai, also an SDF, um, shared how she was somewhat sick of the way land acknowledgements have been used and abused sometimes for the presenter's own ego or gain, and instead provided thank you, an acknowledgement for responsibility. In this call to responsibility, we each have to consider our research in light of the political situations and genocides and displacements occurring around the world today. By what Jasbir Pora highlights, exposes the failures of queer and liberal theories and the complicitness of our research. The second land acknowledgement was for an event held by the Center of Culture and Technology at UFT, of which the presenter read a par the paragraph that I just said, and added, quote, I also wish to acknowledge the ongoing violence of global genocide. Stuff like that. Okay, acknowledged. So what? I'm gonna keep talking. Um, what both these land acknowledgements are doing is showing the intertwined natures of settler colonialism around the world, uh, when of course doing it better. So what I wanna do with my time here is to discuss somewhat quickly that intertwined nature of settler colonialism's dispossession in relation to the histories and presence of Turtle Island and Palestine. Let's begin with U of T's president, Merrick Gertler. In this message to the U of T community uh, on the conflict in the Middle East, he asks us, in the midst of such a conflict in which violence and suffering on both sides has evoked such deep memories of historical injustices and caused great pain, how should we comport ourselves? Pause. This comportment is then paired with responsibility. Quote, our university must demonstrate to the world how civil informed debate about difficult issues can be conducted. So let's be charitable. You're talking, you're Mary, you're talking about responsibility. Let's delve into civil and informed 
comported land acknowledgement in four steps. Okay. Keep following along. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Four steps. You're here for it. One, UTSC's most Muslim Students Association statement on Palestine does as well. We strongly uphold the international values of justice, peace, and unity for all innocent people, including Christian, Jewish, and Muslim individuals. We condemn Israel's attempts to block all access to water, food, electricity, and all other humanitarian assistance in Gaza. We condemn the bombing of medical personnel and innocent civilians endangering the lives of 2.3 million people. The restricted access to aid coupled with limited means for Palestinians to leave, leave amidst the continued siege effectively transforms Gaza into the world's most expansive open air prison. These actions are not just a crime against millions of Palestinians, but a crime against humanity. Two, many of you may have heard the term land grab universities, um, usually referred to American land grant universities, which are financed through governmental dispossession of indigenous land as traced through the Morrill Act in 1862. As shown on landgrabview.org, nearly 11 million acres of indigenous land, approximately 250 tribal nations, over 160 violence black backed treaties and land seizures, and further, the Morrill Act worked by turning land taken from tribal nations into seed money for higher education. The result, 52 universities benefiting where indigenous people remain, quote, largely absent from student population, staff, faculty, and curriculum. Three of four. As Ghazal Golshiri writes, according to the Palestinian news agency Wafa, the Israeli army has destroyed or damaged all 12 universities in the Gaza Strip. At the beginning of January, Around 75% of the enclave's educational infrastructure has been damaged, according to the UN. Step four, UFT's professors Mariana Valverde and Brian Gettler write that UFT, quote, acquired almost 226,000 acres of land from the crown in 1827. This endowment land was largely sold to settlement farmers as a way to generate revenue and fund the university. How's Valverde say it? Of course, these lands were taken from indigenous people, and here we are today. So I ask, is this what the response, what is the response that we're taking? And I, ha I have Merrick, I use my phone, call him a first name basis. Um, I guess I acknowledge that I'm grateful for the opportunity to work on dispossessed land. Uh, and that sounds kind of weird, right? I'm not trying to be facetious with it either. At some level, I don't entirely know how to proceed. But I think with making the acknowledgement, trying to learn more about what's happening, being vocal, being active, is answering a call to responsibility. And being open to being looked forward to staying all that. Understanding our shared lives on this land is a step. I'll end with a quote from Muhammad Abdu. We need to move towards proactive strategic movement objectives that center our collective livingness, thriving, and liberation. And that's why I'm like, oh, let me be proud. Okay, knowledge where we are, we're gathered, great. Usually it'd be like, okay, next person, and then they come up, and then I would come back and be like, hello, everyone again. Now I'm going to introduce Chris. Lovely. This is the bio she said. <laughs> Chris Ayanofila is a trans woman PhD student at the University of Toronto and a social historian of past articulations of trans feminine existence. In addition to her scholarship on trans feminine porn and sex work, she's a historian of 20th century anglophone trans feminine subcultures. She hopes her analysis of the complexities and messiness of past trans lives honors those who built the path she now walks on. Lovely, to the point, concise, unlike me, because I'm going to keep talking. So, some more about Chris, or maybe not about Chris. Tomorrow is the trans day of visibility. And there you go. You might scoff at this. She might scoff at this. I have it right there. That was, that was a scoff. Zoom people, they couldn't see it, but it, it happened. But I think it's, it's worth mentioning because it's serendipitous. Chris's work is unapologetically trans feminine. I adore that. I love it. I remember what she said while on the panel of trans histories in Canada and Germany, that she's partisan about trans femininity. And when she said that, I, I was floored. I nearly fell off my feet. I was like, what? Her work as a historian intrinsically deals with erasures, uncoverings, 
and joining the shouts yelling, trans women aren't anything new. And as such, I see the rel relevance of visibility. As seen in the acknowledgements from her now award-winning master's thesis, or shall I say, gold medal for outstanding master's thesis from the University of Victoria. She writes, quote, the settler colonial academy doesn't like trans people. Well, that's not entirely true. It likes to use us as generative metaphors, interview us for no to low honoraria, study us to burnish resumes, misread us as, quote, effeminate men or masculine women, exoticize, exploit, pathologize, and ultimately dehumanize us. In turn, I'm asking, what can you do? When people say, trans, this is new, or in a more academic way, where are the trans femmes in the historical archives? Chris shows us some of them are in hotels, personal ads, magazines, and having community dinners with each other. How lovely, how cute. You might think Chris's work is solely archival, solely historical, but you'd be wrong. Her work spells into, spills into the present where trans femme community becomes both an ethic and a praxis a praxis where she becomes part of the inspirations and one of the driving forces behind a T4T group, which is essentially a research group for trans and non-binary grad students doing trans studies. And if this sounds like you, hit me up. Uh, she's pushed for a handful of us to get back into the pool for trans pool hours. Shout out Thursdays, 535, 6.50. Quite literally for me, returning to a place I abandoned years ago. And somewhat jokingly, or maybe not, suggesting to go to a quote trans bar event at Mandy Goodhand, where of course trans folks get in for free. It's actually tomorrow, 9 p.m. Australia. I also appreciate the cultural nature of your claims, Chris. Instead of Chris's claims, of your claims. Talking about getting through for me right there. Outlining the quote. Overwhelmingly white, middle class, positive, and oftentimes homophobic nature of the archives, which nevertheless were also sites of life saving care and sisterhood. In a, in a time of political strife, higher anxiety, and suspicion around transness, and in particular trans femininity, holding onto a T for T community where the good and bad can both exist, as Chris also highlights, in an ecosystem, is critical. It's clear that Chris loves trans women. <laughs> Thank you. I, re I, I wrote this just for you, so I'm glad I, I'm getting those laughs out. Chris's research is about expanding trans world, developing trans communities, and putting the legwork in to really make it happen. And to end this intro, I'll leave you all with what she told me when I said I had her paper, How Trans Transgressive a Transsexual, on my to-read list. Well, I hope you like the article, or even better, if you don't. Maybe that was just for me, but in either case, please join me in introducing the woman of the hour and my dear sister, Chris Pilas. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, case tonight. It's uh, every Thursday. I'm excited to go. Uh, eventually, not tomorrow. Uh, I got to sleep after this. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Sam and the Sex Salon for having me. I'm so thankful for the audience in person and on Zoom. As Sam talked about, uh, this talk, like all my work in the Academy, is for trans people. And for the trans folks in person or over Zoom, let's really take in what that means, what being here means. We've gathered together in community as trans people to learn about past trans communities. Let's sit with that a moment. You came here for, um, I said free food, I, whatever, something happened. Uh, <laughs> because you wanted to be amongst tra other trans people, learn about your history, or for other reasons. No matter the why, you came here. A trans person amongst other trans people to learn about other trans people. We've always been around. We've always found each other. And we've always gathered in community. I'd like to start with a quote about another group of trans people who met on a Wednesday evening. Or maybe, okay. Uh, this is from the July 1960 issue of Transvestia. 
By this time, trans woman Susanna Valenti had been running the Chevalier de Honor Resort, which would eventually move locations to become Casa Susana. Both locations were secluded cabin grounds where trans femmes could temporarily express their trans femininity. A reader named Nancy wrote into Transvestia to praise Susanna's efforts and added that it made her recall a little coterie of close friends of mine who were accustomed uh, to gather at my apartment in New York City in the early 1930s. There were seven in the group. Five were married and lived in the suburbs. We met on Wednesday evenings. Although not a large apartment, there were two bedrooms, one of which was used exclusively for storing the clothing for our other selves. Each guest arrived at a different time, so there was no confusion in preparing for the evening. To keep our clothing clean and pressed, and to tidy up the apartment for myself, I employed a pretty light-skinned black girl who was to be trusted, receiving sufficient recompense to assure this. When we met, she remained to assist the girls in dressing and putting on their makeup, at which she was very clever. She also quaffered our wigs for us as needed. The boudoir, as it was called, was appointed in most feminine fashion. We spent many delightful evenings chatting about the latest fashions, the theater, etc. If one discovered a shop where the owner was sympathetic to us, it would be revealed. I knew a buyer in one of the stores uh, who would give me a buzz when something which she thought would be becoming arrived. The smaller shops were more fun, though, as there one could have a fitting for one's purchases. If one of us was wearing a new frock or lingerie, she would be persuaded to model it for the rest of us while we all oohed and awed over the garment. I, da I dare say our greatest delight was window shopping along the avenue, not as a group, but in twos or threes. We always felt more secure this way and with less chance of attracting attention. During those few hours together, we could live the lives society denied us. I wonder if any other readers have had similar little groups and will in turn tell us about them. I open with this quote for two reasons. First, much of the trans past is opaque to us and it always will be. This group of seven trans femmes created a small bubble of unbelievable belonging with emotional and spiritual nourishment for them. This was in the 1930s, and it only appears once in print 30 years later. Though it is coming up on 100 years ago, the 1930s is so recent for trans history. Across time and place, there have been ebbs and flows of societal acceptance of what we may think of as trans folks. But all too often, we've had to operate in secret hopefully away from the eyes of cis head authorities, and so out of the archives. The communities that I'll be speaking about tonight represent one half of my scholastic focus, the other's porn. <laughs> um, and I love spending time with them, partly because they're trans femmes in trans femme community that created trans authored and centered magazines that I then you know, swing into 30 years later and turn to history. But all too often in trans history, we deal in evil. We, we deal in hostile sources, arrest records for cross-dressing, colonial encounters with exoticized effeminate men and masculine women, exoticizing, pathologizing, and dehumanizing clinical reports on sexual deviance. These unfortunately make up the bulk of the archive for trans historians. And we, trans historians, take it and we use these negative sources for hopefully positive purposes, demonstrating a trans presence in the past. From fragments of what survived, we create an inherently flawed image of the past. For all the evidence of trans past that survived, there is an unfathomable amount that did not. These past trans lives did not make it into the archive, but perhaps they had the good fortune to remain hidden. So many hidden lives, hidden communities, hidden worlds. But for those like Nancy, from the quote, who had such a space, removed from a viciously trans-misogynistic society for a few hours each week, think about what that meant, right? And the second reason for this quote is to think about race, or rather racism, right? Think about Nancy's unnamed Black servant. She supported the trans femininity of these seven white women and femmes. Trans feminine subcultures, the ones that I focus on, were overwhelmingly informally racially segregated and economically stratified. As Sam mentioned, the straight trans feminine subculture culture that I'll be talking about tonight comes out of my thesis, my ongoing research. I assembled a former from 423 issues of magazines, newsletters, broadsheets, and periodicals of 18 different trans feminine works, 
that were very, very published from 1960 to 1995. New York City, Boston, Philadelphia, LA were all major hubs for the subculture, but there were groups in most major American cities, Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, and across the sea in the UK, the Western Cape of South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. This is an interconnected, cross-continental, I refuse to say transcontinental, transfeminine, it just irritates me, um, network. But 1960 wasn't when trans femmes released the first trans femme magazine. In 1952, there were a few issues of the first run of Transvestia, a Long Beach uh, trans femme published and centered magazine that Virginia Prince relaunched in 1960. From 1918 to 1920 in Montreal, we had Les Mouches Fantastiques, which while often characterized as a lesbian periodical, uh, I think it more reflects a certain kind of gender fucky invocation uh, of gender and sexuality that white North Americans in the 20th century moved away from. And indeed, in terms of the first network for trans femmes, Weimar Germany in the 1920s and 1930s had a German language network uh, of predominantly non-trans run trans periodicals. And even earlier, for the use of coded language, trans femmes connected in the global in global North periodicals from at least the 19th century. We're not, we're not ever going to know the definitive first trans femme magazine. And I'm quite happy with that, or at least I don't really care. Um, 1960 is simply when a bouquet of English language titles emerges. How many flowers were in this bouquet? I don't know. Uh, in Kate McKinney's recent wonderful work, a North American second wave feminist periodical networks titled Information Activism, uh, they estimate there are upwards of 500 potential magazine titles. But that's to quote, the precarity and ephemerality of these publications makes it impossible to know precisely how many individual periodicals existed. The problem's even worse for us, for me. Um, from the extant archive, we know there was a robust and thriving cross-continental English language trans feminine periodical network from 1960 until the mid 2000s. But the smaller, more precarious and often secretive or obscurationist uh, nature of trans feminine subcultural institutions like periodicals or clubs prevents a precise measure of either. Even the largest and longest running trans periodical, the TBTS Tapestry, does not have an institutionally archived complete run as of 2024. It's missing, I think, the first six or seven issues. In 1989, community luminary Dr. Sheila Kirk gave a speech in which she estimated that for 1989 in the United States, there are now 152 organizations and clubs known who are composed of the transgendered community. In Canada, there are 15 such groups. There are groups in England, in Europe, in Asia, in South Africa, with more emerging on a regular basis. But as will soon become clear, she's leaving out plenty of folks. For all this opacity in an unknown number of titles, in an unknown number of pages, unknown numbers of trans femmes may have lived their entire trans feminine lives in lost ephemeral works. They fought each other, cried together, and loved each other as sisters, friends, or girlfriends. Just because those feelings are lost to us, it doesn't make them less real. But don't worry, there's plenty of archive big feelings. We'll get to that. For the subcultural network I'll be speaking about, I call it the straight trans feminine subculture, I use straight, I deployed straight for two reasons. First, from the subcultural elite's intense discursive pressure to disarticulate sexual non-normativity, particularly homosexuality, from trans femininity. Uh, sorry to bum people out, but the trans femininity of this network was not really the trans femininity of uh, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. Secondly, and relatedly, the reason for this discursive disarticulation derived a lot of these uh, from subcultural elites intense pursuit of respectability to the non-trans white middle class and heteronormative mainstream these two core themes inform the primary thrust of my thesis what was properly feminine apparel and comportment um, and they also shaped who could join certain social groups and the nature of events which i'll be talking about today and this notion of who could join inform the subculture's borders of trans femininity with the notable exception of Virginia Prince's transmisogynistic network of sororities for heterosexual male cross-dressers, most members commonly blur trans identities within a spectrum of shared feminine affinity. The most obvious example of this comfort was the title of the straight trans feminine subculture's tentpole periodic, the TVTS Tapestry. The title uh, referenced transvestites, TV, 
and transsexuals, TS. And I'll be saying those acronyms. Countless editorial statements, group charters, and mottos all emphasize an umbrella of shared trans femininity between myriad articulations. In 1991, the Toronto-based Canadian Crossdresser Club proclaimed that they were a national organization, crossdressers, transgenderists, transsexuals, and female impersonators. So in periodicals, group meetings, socials, and conventions, we had transsexual women and transvestites socializing under an umbrella of shared difference. We had a range of identities and behaviors socializing with an intuitive understanding of shared trans femininity, which included heterosexual male crossdressers, transgender, transgenderal, transgenderist, transsexual, and transgendered women, transvestites, third gendered people, new women, bigender men and women, crossovers, transes, women of transgender and transsexual past, male lesbians, which is a real fun one, uh, female mimics, gender transients, androgynins, uh, and further variances that intermingled in community periodicals. With this fluidity, uh, it would seemingly follow that there was a degree of acceptance or co-mingling with sexual non-normativity as well. But this was not the case. Those in the straight trans feminine subculture often viciously distinguish themselves from gay trans feminine identities like hair fairies or drag and street queens. Members varied in their level of differentiation. Some had an unemotional sense of difference and others were virulently homophobic. Marissa Cheryl Lynn uh, was the longtime editor of Tapestry and by all accounts, quite accepting of gay trans femmes as sisters under the trans feminine umbrella, but still she had a recognition of difference. When she met Sylvia Rivera in 1984, she told Tapestry readers that Sylvia represents a segment of our community that is totally foreign to me, drag queens in the city streets. It is not a segment in which most of us would long survive. Yet Sylvia's efforts have affected us all, which reinforces my belief that regardless of our sexual preference or lifestyle, we are all in the same boat together. On the other end of my uh, constructed binary, we have Esther, who in a 1988 letter in All Femme, she argued, uh, dear All Femme, I would like to comment that I would like to see your content be limited to transgenders, heterosexual or otherwise. I do not care for blatantly gay material, although as an, uh, as an artistic part of a story, it is not offensive. Personally, I don't mind gays as friends. I just don't wish, say, um, I just don't wish their literature, it's like a comma, but uh, I just don't wish their literature laying around my study. I also do not feel that material relating to strange fetishes, such as bondage, rubber, baby clothing, good Lord, long <laughs> in a magazine dealing with transgender people. But I realize I'm saying gay and straight a lot. Uh, and you might think you know what that means, but I need to step down to define how many in the subculture understood this term. Many straight trans feminine subculture members understood homosexuality to mean any amorous interest in men, though transsexual women were mostly effectively absent from this class factory logic, mostly. Uh, additionally, these members viewed non-transsexual trans feminine identities and behaviors as ultimately asterisk men. So many believed it would it was gay to have sex with other trans feminine people. In addition, numerous members assumed any attempt to look sexually attractive was done to seduce men. This definition underpinned the oftentimes virulent homophobia of members. This is part of a wider hatred of sexual non-normativity or deviancy. Many respectable trans feminine community members despised trans feminine sex workers and frequently leveled viciously horophobic insults upon them. In addition, they loathed fetishistic articulations of trans femininity. So both trans feminine people who had a petticoat, so many petticoat, uh, maid or latex, French maid, French maid fetish, or those for whom their trans femininity was a sexual fetish. For many straight trans feminine members who again, wish to disarticulate sexuality and, and trans femininity and kind of at a broader level, gender from sexuality, they often understood heterosexual sex to include when a non-transsexual trans feminine person had sex with a non-trans woman. But really, as is reflected with the usual academic understanding of heteronormativity, most of these members viewed themselves as simply normal, natural. There were normal people, gays, and deviants, and some thought those last two overlapped. This view of sexuality informed how heteronormativity manifested in the subculture. But so too did this idea of a normal person, or more uncomfortably, normal man, underpin and inform the subculture. 
as I've already griped about, even for one of the more visible trans femme subcultures, definitive historical reconstruction is impossible for many aspects of it. Because uh, like it, these are ultimately magazines. Um, so, and a key impossibility is the definitive demographic sketch of an average member. Given the very valid fears of material violence that a trans femme faced, faces, if someone outed her, exact reconstruction is impossible in terms of like exact member lists. The valid fear of discovery common manifest, commonly manifested members not wanting to subscribe to the magazines, because then you'd have to give an address. Uh, the use of multiple femme and mask aliases for, tra for trans femmes. The use of PO boxes driving across multiple state lines to buy trans femme materials uh, and other efforts. Despite all these difficulties, I am nothing if not a stereotypically tenacious trans woman. And so I try my best to imperfectly reconstruct the average subculture member. I use reader polls, quotes from staff on who they imagine was reading their magazines, uh, the economic tenor of advertisements, and more methods I discuss uh, in depth in my thesis. But all these have easily imaginable pitfalls to them. Not to shock anyone, but sometimes people lie about who they are. <laughs> you know, but after you read over 400 trans femme magazines, you kind of get vibes, of, you know, what's going on. So the typical member was white, at least middle class, and often married to a non-trans woman. And their trans feminine expression was liminal. I love liminality. Uh, liminal or liminality, we can think of as sort of temporary or a space in between. Uh, for that cool ornate door, the, the thin space between this room and that hallway outside, um, that's a liminal space. Transsexual women made a minority of the subculture's members, and even then, they were typically stealth. They usually disclosed their trans status to no one or trust a few. Whenever I would watch shows growing up, I was when they would do that, I was like, that's so ridiculous, but I, I get it now. Um, transsexual women like me are quite legible, right? As like being members of the trans community. We're, we're women full time. We are easily reconcilable to our big old happy 2024 trans feminine umbrella. But for the subculture, we were far from the majority. We were, from my reckoning, quite outnumbered by the liminally trans feminine. Trans femmes who commonly use the term transvestite or, or cross-dresser to, to identify oneself as a transsexual woman, typically, and there's obvious exceptions, meant that you've gotten the surgery, you've gotten a vagina. Uh, we we're, yeah, overwhelmingly outnumbered by folks who commonly use the term transvestite or cross-dresser. Sometimes one will be full-time transvestite, which is part of how we eventually actually get transgender, um, or folks who would really emphasize that they were a heterosexual transvestite or a heterosexual male transvestite. But those who called themselves cross-dressers or transvestites were the majority in the subculture. And so with a few important exceptions, like specific subcultural spaces like Female Mimics International, the average reader is white, at least middle class, often married to a non-trans woman, and their trans feminine expression was liminal. At club meetings and you know, locked hotel rooms, uh, it wasn't full time, to use the term. But how did I know everybody was white? There are two main answers. But for the pur purposes of time, I'll stick to the more straightforward answer that people just told me. Uh, in 19, or ghost just told me. In 1992, uh, community pillar Joanne Roberts noted that she was part of a relatively large support group in Philadelphia. Again, Philadelphia. Uh, we have about 350 members, yet very few are minorities in our support group, and it's not because we're not open to them. Uh, Jessica, who was a rare Black member of Joanne's group, expressed how it felt to be one of the few racialized members. When I attend meetings as a full-fledged card-carrying member of Renaissance, I still feel that awful sense of detachment, isolation, because I'm Black. Don't get me wrong, it's not like I'm shunned at meetings, that isn't the case. They then go on to write, I often wonder just what I'm doing at such an assemblage. Then I ask, where are the others like me? Why am I alone in a sea of white faces? While racial disparities in wealth were factors in this absence, uh, I think I have two other persuasive answers to Jessica's question. I think that the overwhelmingly white demographics of these spaces and the casual racism in the extant record meant that these spaces were likely rife with racist microaggressions and this alienated racialized trans femmes. Jessica's question has a second possible answer. Racialized trans feminine folks likely joined the many other subcultures that poor black and brown trans femme people were the majority in. 
I think of the TV show Pose, Paris is Burning, you know, the Bulls. If someone joined one of these groups, they likely would have felt more comfortable in a less potentially racist space, and they uh, would have had more in common with fellow racialized trans femmes. But the main caveat is that uh, these communities typically move within and were part of gay subcultures. If a racialized trans feminine person was loath to associate with gay people, they would not want to join these groups. Just as members were aware of the absence of racialized people in their subculture, they were also conscious of the intercommunity gulf between the straight trans feminine subculture and gay black and brown trans feminine groups. In 1992, Joanne Roberts commented on the, quote, division between our suburban white cross-dressers and the inner city minority cross-dressers. It's almost like two separate worlds, two totally separate worlds. In a tapestry letter from 1995, mother of the house of Selena, Chelsea Selena noted uh, that it is common for self-described drag queens, transsexuals, and people like myself who fall into both camps, pun intended, to be mother, daughter, sister, and lover to one another in the same house with no conflict in love and loyalty by how we define ourselves sexually. She then said, what is more difficult is for us to feel at one with white middle-class cross-dressers whose determination to disassociate from the gay and drag communities borders on outright homophobia. Indeed, many white middle-class members of the straight trans feminine subculture would have been unsettled if they were connected with those who understood their gender under the gay umbrella. The most damning indictment of the subculture's opulence and homophobia came from its most denigrated figure, a trans feminine sex worker. In 1995 gender trash interview, Mary Sully Ross spoke with two-spirit former sex worker dancing the Eagle Spirit, and she identified the power differential between outworking class trans feminine people and those who would transition later in life. When Ross asked her if she experienced whole phobia from trans social group members, dancing the Eagle Spirit said, totally, the transsexuals from the upper middle class, I called them the secondary transsexuals. They're the ones who have been fortunate to live long enough as men before coming out as women. So they didn't have to live through the poverty, discrimination, through the ostracization. They established themselves as men, and then they became women. She went on to define primary transsexuals as street-based sex workers who came out as women young. She contrasted this group with those, quote, who came out after getting their houses, their wives, and their kids, and who then put us down for not having taken advantage of hetero male privileges. Uh, 29 years later, Dance in the Eagle Spirit's critique springs true. But so too is the violence and torment of the closet. The closet is an agony for, for trans femmes, for all us queer and trans folks. In 1992, an unnamed writer for the Ottawa-based trans femme magazine, Notes from the Underground, wrote, there are, of course, cross-dressers who have gone to the grave with their cross-dressing secret intact. For some, I imagine the fear was greater than the need for revelation. For others, I have no doubt, the secrecy itself brought them to an earlier end. Either way, their lives were acts of self-sacrifice that were never acknowledged. That is true. What is also true is that these liminal trans femmes had, quote historian of transvestia Robert Hill, one foot in the normative mainstream and the other in the social margins. Those who moved through the world as seemingly normal, you know, red-blooded American men, white men, had much to lose in terms of their family, their job, their wife and kids. For myself, the consistent subcultural presence of homophobia, whorephobia, and otherwise exclusionary policies, though members did often typically violate them, indicates that many desired at least a veneer of heteronormative normalcy, respectability politics. They may have desired this image to preserve their socioeconomic positionality or to make trans femininity respectable to normal society or themselves, or for reasons that are forever unknown to me. Yes. This does not take away from the distress and agony that they experience as closeted trans femmes, but it also does not excuse their oftentimes violent exclusivity. But I've talked a lot about who these members were and the walls that they erected, what were inside these metaphorical walls. There could be endless possibilities for the simultaneously magical and banal. And because I'm a cool social historian, when I talk about social space inside the walls is not just in-person event spaces. Social spaces include easily legible in-person events like conventions, club meetings, and retreats, which subculture members held throughout the year. But social spaces also included the, the periodicals themselves. These magazines were not internet, virtual, ephemeral spaces. Trans feminine people read these works 
in locked rooms, motel suites on fake business trips, or hurriedly in the aisles of the sex shops where they are commonly sold. For the many closeted members of the subculture, these more liminal examples were essential lifelines for trans feminine social life. In 1990, the closeted transsexual woman named Karen explained to female mix international leaders that, quote, due to my job and family matters, I cannot be the female I'd like to. So I must settle for knowing that I'm a TS and will always be a woman in the man's body and ugly men's clothes. The pages of trans feminine magazines were the entire movable closet of Karen's trans femininity. Her trans femininity and her experiences in community matter. She lived her true self through magazine pages. We'll never know how many were like her, but she was not alone. Members could be in community through reading the magazine and writing into it, but a key pillar was correspondence, or as put by an anonymous author in the 1987 article for Lady Day, correspondence is a very important part of the transvestite lifestyle. Not only is there an inner desire to share your activities with someone by letter and photo exchange, but this network of communication, this grapevine, if you will, also circulates information. Correspondence with other enthusiasts creates social contacts. It acts as an exchange for ideas and opinions. And best of all, it provides an opportunity to show off a little. Connection and community wasn't in such a nourishing part of being in a trans feminine space. When an isolated trans feminine person realizes she's not alone, it's a sacred experience. I felt that way. Countless women and femmes in these magazines said the same. You know, even right now, in this room, it's very groovy to be around other trans people, other queer people. And again, if you're closeted and for reasons of safety could not engage with in-person trans femme spaces, correspondence was indeed a very important part to being in community. And for histories of LGBT periodicals, it's also important that we can queer our understandings of textual and in-person uh, spaces. Very often people read these magazines together in small groups or at club meetings. In 1994, Jennifer and her girlfriend Paige, who were both trans women, wrote into the, the, into the sexually open Female Minutes International and spoke of how much they loved to sit down together and go to the personals, send letters off not only to these potential gentlemen friends, but letters to FMI for a personal act. To these women's point, these magazines were venues to meet people in person liaisons. Uh, essentially 90% of what I've quoted and read from so far, like you could find this very easily on your phones. All you need to do is Google Digital Transgender Archive and then one of the magazine titles. And if you do, uh, you can read the magazines that I use them as top. And if you do, you'll quickly notice that sometimes the last third of the magazines are entirely made up of personal ads, people seeking connection. Tim Christie described the purpose of FMI's personal sections as a place where folks like us can meet and talk. We make new friends here and maybe find a lover or two, or just a playmate, but here's where it all waits for you. Magazines flaunted having plenty of new personal ads as a mark of subcultural quality, like this issue of Tapestry, which promised both over 700 accurate and up-to-date personal listings, plus an updated directory of organizations and services. But for many subcultural members, the goal was to exist in an in-person community. There were, and are actually, uh, clubs, sororities, regular conventions, and like I've the talk with informal hands, with the time that I have, I'll zoom in on those first three. Oftentimes, magazines would have an affiliated social club. For Tapestry, it was the Boston-based Tiffany Club. For Fanfare, it was the Phoenix Society. And eventually, for Transvestia, you have the Trias Network of sororities. If you bought the periodical, you would know about the club. But what's more is that oftentimes, magazines would print out nationals and international groups that they were aware of. As befits its temple status, Tapestry was the best of this. This is a random uh, 19, late 1980s issue that has 12 pages of in-person community groups, surgeons, endocrinologists, and therapists. As this was very much a global North-based network, we have, uh, again, state by state, um, except for Idaho, uh, dense coverage for America and Canada. And then we also have England, we have Australia, France, and Germany, then the overwhelmingly white South African Phoenix Society, and then the Japanese Elizabeth Club. It's typically the one they mean when they mention Asia, it is one club. Uh, if you wanted to join a club, entry requirements varied in their strictness. The Philadelphian Renaissance Club group's process was pretty uh, standard, I found. One had to be interviewed by phone or correspondence by the group's executive, 
before they would disclose the time and location of gatherings. Uh, some were more open, but that was more rare. Uh, typically, if they had an easier joining process, they were also more, they, they were more cool with kind of sexual diversity. Um, on the other side of that binary, Virginia Prince's exclusive network of sororities for heterosexual male transvestites carried out the most stringent assessment process. Before her 1974 expulsion from leadership, Virginia Prince conducted all intake interviews for the Alpha Chapter of Tri Sigma, and she held veto power over the admission of uh, new members. So this vigorous intake process was to ensure the exclusion of all potentially gay and or transsexual members. As you can see from some of the listings, uh, if they use the word closed, that typically meant members could just be heterosexual male transvestites. Although there was the XX Club in upstate New York, which um, was just for transsexuals. And then um, there was the, there was the, eventually in the 90s, there was the Conference of the New Woman, which was just for transsexual women who had completed vaginoplasty and kept out everyone else, which is, um, which is a lot. Uh, <laughs> but um, if they were open, oh yeah, so if they were closed, that typically meant members could just be heterosexual male, male transvestites and their non trans wife. Some of these closed groups would have, um, they would have wives, uh, wife auxiliaries. Uh, well, typically, well, open typically meant anyone could join, though they typically had to toe a certain line of respectability to, if not heteronormativity, certainly keeping one's kinks from the down low, as in this example. Marissa Cheryl Lynn, longtime editor of Tapestry and the head of the Boston Tiffany Club, provides a good example of typical club organizer attitudes. In 1980, she informed uh, readers that her Tiffany Club was, quote, a legal nonprofit corporation with the stated objective being of actual and effective service to the TVTS community. That means Tiffany must be growth oriented, service oriented, and provide facilities and activities that are secure and free of fear. And what uh, some persons may consider sexual or far out behavior. In order to develop and retain the trust and confidence of old, new, and potential members and supporters, Tiffany must maintain an image of integrity and remain strictly on the up and up. Tiffany is not concerned with the sexual preferences of its members and guests. Tiffany is concerned that everyone behave themselves and protect the security and peace of mind of everyone, members and guests alike. For Lynn and most subculture organizers, this attitude reflected a sort of common sense orthodoxy. Overt displays of eroticism or sexual fetish distress or alienate potential members. And so these exclusionary policies were reinscribed as inclusionary measures to accommodate Fuller rainbow for trans femininity, which reminds me of Can't Get Pride discourse that is every year. Mm -hmm. But again, my read is that this isn't some like elite level imposition, but seemingly desired from most members, or at least they would kind of play along in official club spaces. Once someone joined a trans feminine group or attended an in-person event, they gained access to a social social space, which in the words of Marissa Cheryl Lynn was an extended closet. For those who were previously isolated in their trans femininity, these gatherings were a magnificent oasis, as one could finally meet others like them. They could dress femme and be amongst members that understood them on some level. These experiences provided a further source of deep happiness from the sense of community and gender affirmation that they gave people. These sanctuaries could be secluded campgrounds, clubhouses, apartments, hotel rooms, or a member's living room. Sometimes they're in the backs of bars or other private rooms. The rarest but most valued social space was the clubhouse. Since Marissa Cheryl Lynn was a fellow girl boss, Tapestry and its affiliated Tiffany Club naturally had a clubhouse uh, in, a, in a Boston suburb. In 1983, she said that, quote, a facility such as Tiffany serves as a retreat, as a base of operations, a hot story for travelers and residents for qualified and needy persons. It also provides security, privacy, storage, a boutique, a place for casual get-togethers, educational programs, in quotes, or uh, in whatever this is, uh, beauty comportment classes, an on-premise library, theme rap sessions, et cetera, and, uh, and social events big and small. It also provides an office, a headquarters, and a central gathering point for a strong core group of people. It's that vital core group of people that keeps an organization going and gets the job done, end quote. Due to members' intense pursuit of privacy, pictures of clubhouses in use are actually quite rare, which makes one of the few examples that I found all the better as it comes from here, Toronto. Since 1987, 
The Wild Side Boutique was a sex store that sold trans femme goods, magazines, and apparel on the ground floor. And at a clubhouse upstairs for the Canadian Crossdressers Club. And it's still around. We could go to it after this. Um, now it's for everyone, but still basically caters to trans femmes. This nondescript storefront on a random Toronto street is a seminal part of trans femme Toronto and Canadian history. In the Canadian Crossdresser Club newsletters for winter 1992 issue, they gave a tour of their clubhouse. We see first a tour of the Wild Side Boutique that's, that sells femme shoes and woman sizes from 9 to 14, uh, which I really need. There are also larger size femme clothes, makeup, jewelry, larger size lingerie that includes gaps that help tuck. We also have hip pads, breast forms, and wigs, plus trans femme erotica and magazines, including uh, some of the ones that I referenced. And here we have services the Wild Side offers which includes feminization service sessions for makeup and clothes. And sometimes these are essentially short workshops where one could learn how to look like a woman, which of course are filled with very distinct understandings of respectable femininity. So in this picture, uh, Wild Side's owner, Patty, is giving a feminizing makeup makeover to Bernadette. So all this is on a random Toronto street. Imagine being an isolated trans femme and stepping into the space for the first time. This is a time before trans Twitter, Reddit, 4chan, Discord. <laughs> this would have been quite the cornucopia. And finally, we haven't gotten downstairs. The actual boutique. Uh, this is 400 square foot. This is the, the clubhouse. 400 square feet. That meant so much to so many. Of course, uh, there's plenty of floor to ceiling mirrors uh, as well. We also have four twin beds to accommodate overnight stays for trans femme members. We have six makeup stations, which we don't actually see. There's also a change room, club lockers, and a bath. Lockers are actually quite common, as a trans femme would often potentially store her entire femme wardrobe, her entire trans feminine existence in a locker, away from her wife, kids, and others. These clubhouses, meeting spaces, and conventions were, I think, sacred spaces on some level. Um, but like any community, they were not without their tensions and conflict. The unexclusionary policies I talked about earlier were the sometimes petty cruelties of members. In 1992, Owen wrote into Tapestry to say, Dear Naomi, recently I attended my first big weekend affair. It was my first time out in public, and so I was quite apprehensive and nervous. Generally speaking, I had a marvelous time. However, I was and still am deeply distressed by the behavior and experience, appearance of some of the participants. Isn't there something we can do to legally prevent some of these undesirables from attending our events? These are spaces where trans femmes could bond and learn distinct forms of femininity, which can sometimes be quite harsh lessons. In 1990, a trans femme named Lisa wrote into Female Women's International to excitedly talk about her first time at a trans femme support meeting. Lisa wrote that she met a bunch of absolutely wonderful and very helpful sisters. For instance, I did not realize that I was holding my cigarette like a man or that I do not walk like a lady, for which I still need more practice. Me too. As well, larger conventions were economically prohibitive to all but a tiny slice of trans femmes. Implicit whiteness was, of course, ever present. Uh, here is an ad for a 1991 Atlanta Southern Conference Comfort Convention that begins. It's been said that the South shall rise again. And it sure, yeah, it sure looks like they've risen to this occasion. <laughs> like so like so many other gender support groups are doing around the country, several have banded together in a confederation to put on the South's first major gender-oriented event, Southern Comfort, October 3rd to 6th, 1991, Atlanta, Georgia. And again, oftentimes like the first major event, they just ignore the ball scene that would have been Atlanta at this time. So this convention, which again, I'm sure provided nourishing sisterhood to so many, also contained an all femme, that just means dressing trans femininely. Uh, it contained an all femme field trip to Stone Mountain, a lost cause national park that then and now venerated the Confederacy. At this time, 1991, it would have had a replica plantation. And yet, this subculture was hardly exemplary in its homophobia and racism. It was made up of members who came and come from racist and homophobic societies. 
in my opinion, as a white woman, we should not discard the subculture or really any trans community for that matter. In history, we must not shy away from the complexities and evils of the past and of past trans and queer people. This subculture had many gatekeepers, many homophobes, trans misogynists, and horophobic members. It also provided an unfathomable sense of belonging and emotional nourishment to members. Think about the room that we're in now. If you're trans, you're surrounded by other trans people and existing openly and moving through visible trans community. This level of openness did not exist at the time for this, uh, this subculture. The life you have with all its difficulties uh, did not exist for subculture members. Many would and did lose their job, their family, and their kids if their trans femininity was revealed. And so the periodicals, the in-person spaces were often the one place they could belong, the one place they could exist in their gender, their trans femininity. And so I wanna end with one of my favorite examples, the return to Susanna Valenti and class of Susanna. She recalled with the came from Menti members. We have some swings originally placed there for children. A few weeks ago, Dorothy from Chicago, who was our guest, discovered with Susanna that it was marvelous fun to sit on those swings and catch up, so to speak, with that part of our girlhood which had been denied to us. That's why every type of activity, no matter how trivial it may seem, takes on a fascinating quality when we allow our girl selves to perform them. I am critical of much of the subculture, but it did provide an unfathomable sense of comfort and connection to many. This does not take away from members' homophobia, racism, internalized trans misogyny, poor phobia, and petty cruelties. The sisterhood the subculture provided, though it was so damn imperfect, is what we should take from this community. The subculture saved lives. Trans, trans sisterhood saves lives. It saved mine. It sustains me in the academy. Studies of historical trans feminine subcultures are so important to show that history was not as normative as is so often assumed, push back against ahistorical transphobic myths of transness as some recent phenomena symptomatic of societal decline. But most importantly, it is important for contemporary trans communities to know others like ourselves found each other. And while this community is not perfect, what community is? Thank you. I don't know. Um, I guess we'll take five minutes and then we'll come back and have a nice chit chat, Q and A. Yeah. And then yeah, feel free to leave the chat too. I know seven o'clock is very uh so Will, when I was first reading your article, I was pooping my pants because I was like, what if their take is very different from mine? But um there were so many parallels within the New Zealand context, um, in terms of with obviously like local specificities. But within the New Zealand context, um, there is that sort of respectability politics of um, kind of heterosexual transvestites. It wasn't as intense as Virginia Prince's American Network of Sororities, which kept out uh, gay men, gay people, and transsexual women. It wasn't as intense, but it, it was still there. Um, and the interesting thing is that there's such a connected network um, and I find quite interesting that it kind of misses New Zealand. Uh, the main sort of oceanic contact is the Seahorse Club in Australia. And um, they reference, uh, yeah, they mainly reference the Australian Seahorse Club and they kind of miss Hidesia, which was the New Zealand equivalent, which I found quite interesting. But I know Hidesia, the, the New Zealand one, was, actually, was connected to the Australian club and was speaking it was at least reading a lot of these other periodicals. I get into shocking how connected they are. I think within a couple issues of maybe the second or third issue of Virginia Prince's run a transvestia, Los Angeles based, there's people writing it from Montreal, um, another kind of far off, I think there's a letter from England. So yeah, these were shockingly connected communities that again, there's very little actually written on it academically. Thank you. Great, wonderful. Um, oh, nice little five. Can you see that? Thank you, well, thank you, thank you for the shout out. Lovely. Okay. Any other questions? Feelings? Comments? Evelyn, you're like, like, is there anything that really sounds like why is it a politics? Like, is there a discourse about engagement? 
it could just be like, you know, you know, you know just wider politics of trying to separate this out from that, which I know obviously this is just as far as intentional separation of like mm-hmm. say from with race lines and is that also a means for not getting into politics. Yeah, part of how um, I speak to kind of the implicit whiteness of the subculture is that typically when um, there was a general sort of, there was a sense of apoliticalness, but they would oftentimes, you would get folks that are frustrated talking about how we need to be like gay people, we need to be about, we need to be like black people in terms of like fighting for our civil rights. But um, so the fact that there was a sense of like, we're different from these two communities, I took as like, again, a, an interesting sense of positioning. Um, but yeah, there. Well, there is a certain apoliticalness, um, especially in contrast to like uh, to to Star, to Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries. Like they're not flying the Viet, the 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 flag of the Army of Viet Cong. So typically, the political advocacy is very much respectability based in terms of the decriminalization of cross dressing laws, which is underpinned by a respectability politic of um, like we'll just we need to look we need to show that we're not we need to show that cross dressing is like a harmless activity and that we're, we're otherwise normal men. And then um, within kind of the transsexual sphere, you again have that respectability discourse, but very much so like, we're just like normal men, um, normal women um, that, you know, take your pick in terms of narratives of transsexuality. So there, there was a political project, especially increasingly as the, ni- as the 1980s roll into the 1990s, and it becomes much more organized. We eventually get the foundation of the International Foundation for Gender Education, but it's very much sort of like polite advocacy and like talking to people who I would characterize as gatekeepers. Um, as well, you oftentimes have the literal gatekeepers in terms of Terry Benjamin, uh, in terms of a lot of folks who make up what becomes WPATH. They're in these magazines, they're reading them, they're actually publishing articles. They, um, there is, I'm blanking on the name, but one of the WPATH founders has a regular column in tapestry. Uh, so it is quite interesting, like how invercated these sort of, what I characterize as like very much sort of trans feminine communities, how much gatekeepers were actually embedded, non-trans gatekeepers were embedded in these communities as well. Great. Yeah. Any other questions? Dad, is there anything on Zoom world or you can know that if you can read these questions from Dad. Great. Anyone else from the audience? Something on your mind? And the biggest thing about the way that actually the security officers seem to mobilize um, difference, for example, in several sets, several magazine covers that uh, talk about, you know, uh, trans feminine women using a sex culture or one or mm-hmm. some kind of aspiration of those actions. Uh, huge worlds, you know, they mentioned somewhere they had an inquiry between, um, you can't remember her name, but the, the person that uh, talked about being the only black person in the sea of black places. So, what I'm just curious what you make of uh, those kind of uh, outward attempts to include or to call back to um, trans feminine lives of the different. Place and era and temporality. Um, what do you make of that to the whole tension between the actual exclusion from these groups, uh, from these spaces to right, but then kind of also happening on the side of it, specifically to um, kind of uh, make the argument that trans people have a history of the way we don't know forever in perpetuity. So, to repeat, in oh short, yes. uh, <laughs> what do you make of the differences uh, that are kind of somewhat included in the periodicals? And I think that's, that's the gist. Yeah, I mean, um, so I'll kind of, I'll divide the question. So on the question of race, again, there wasn't like, we're, we're open mouth racist. Um, there were to my knowledge, there weren't really any explicit racist, you know, governing laws. There was just um, demographically, implicitly, 
there was such a profound sort of demographic segregation. You know, like even within contemporary queer and trans communities, oftentimes there is something of an implicit racial segregation in terms of white trans folks hanging out together. So I don't take it as tokenism or tokenizing in terms of like having a black person in the cover of tapestry. It's just that there were so few folks demographically. Um, yeah, it wasn't to my knowledge from my kind of reading the archive, it wasn't an explicit attempt at sort of saying like, we're not racist because there wasn't even really that sort of recognition that this was a severe problem. There was a recognition that like, where are all the, the black folks? But um, it wasn't seen as sort of like an intense problem that needed to be actively pursued is my attempt or is my understanding. And then the question of time I think is, I mean, it's kind of what I'm doing, right? Like in terms of, uh, I mean, you know, 20th century, who cares? Early modern, it's sort of that. But um, in terms of uh, trans history, right? Like in pointing to past examples of gender diversity in terms of past trans lives, it is something of um, not a normative, but certainly like a normative, um, an argument for like normalcy in terms of like trans folks have always existed throughout time. I'm doing that with the work that I do. And these folks are doing it at a similar level in terms of pointing to uh, Chevalier Lyon, in terms of pointing to like Joan of Arc, in terms of, and again, this is um, an anti-Indigenous narrative, but like pointing to like Indigenous gender diversity is sort of like from the distant past. These are all uses of history to sort of legitimize contemporary trans existence. So that's what I take from the use of histor historical and historical examples. Um, as well. There's, I know more recently, there's been a lot of discourse over uh, white trans, white trans femmes appropriation of sort of like um, trans feminine indigenous shamanic identities. It's interesting because in a lot of the articles in Tapestry and in other magazines where they talk about indigenous spirituality, there isn't that sort of like, oh, they're like us. There is uh, a surprisingly tasteful, I mean, they use archaic terms, but it's surprisingly sort of like, we're not, we're not literally these successors of like bird ash spirit, but like these are, these are other trans femmes that again is used to legitimize heterosexual male transvestism. I have a question. Yeah. I'll ask my question. I'll give you a long winded one too. Please. Uh, so I don't, I don't know how well your experience I'm just shouting louder, even though you're on here, so for everything. I don't know your experience growing up, um, but like as a young trans girl myself, when I was scouring the internet for the little pieces of transness, I did see come up some of the like dying groups, mm -hmm. right? Like these ones, which is weird to think about, right? Walk on the wild side, it was still happening. And as a kid, I'm like, could I go here? Is this the thing I could do? And I never did because it was kind of weird that feminization stuff was, was wild. Mm -hmm. uh, but what 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 do you make of kind of like being on the cusp of that end? And also, where are these people? Is there a new kind of like generation of similar minded, quote unquote, straight, heterosexual, transvestite? Right? Mm -hmm. right? Is that another thing that's being brought? Because it seems like the Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera angle of transness has, thank God, won out. But mm -hmm. yeah. interesting. Um, so someone, someone uh, I was going to say yelled, someone finally spoke to the audience and said fat boys. Um, yeah, it is interesting. Um, I'll, I'll chop up this question. See, so yeah, I, I put up the slide where I show the various periodicals. I always confuse the two, but I believe it's either en femme or I believe ladylike. It's either ladylike or en femme. That one lasts kind of the second longest. It it dies in the mid 2000s. And then Tapestry, which in 1995 renames itself to the transgender tapestry. That one lasts the longest. And then it dies in I want to say 2008, 2009. So it's kind of like, yeah, it's the last sort of dinosaur. But it's it's been interesting because there have been contemporary attempts to revive periodicals uh, or magazines on some level. Like I'm thinking about um, 
original plumbing, which Alio, please correct me. I think it was like 2010 to 2012. Yeah. Um, yeah, 2010 to 2012. So this is very much a trans mask version of the periodical. And I can I can talk about I can talk about men all day and the trans men in these spaces. Um and then that one kind of dies. And then out of the UK, there's a group called Oystro Generation, which is published on issue of a period of a trans femme periodical that I really enjoyed. But like a lot of these periodicals, it is kind of like shaky in terms of its release schedule, but that one's really fun. But yeah, it is quite interesting um, because as a someone who's partly a historian of periodicals, part of the reason is that the internet scares me because there's so many sources. So around 1984, you actually start getting references to bulletin board systems, BBSs within tapestry, which scared the hell out of me in terms of like, do I have to read this? I'll save it for the dissertation. But yeah, these these groups do kind of die off because a lot of them join the internet. The cohorts that are reading Tapestry join the internet. Um, 1995 is kind of like the peak of Tapestry and then it sort of declines. But um, I have a I have an Ouroboros on my thigh. An Ouroboros is a snake eating its own tail because I find uh, oftentimes the past and present can be quite similar. So while, while heterosexual male transvestites, as I defined it, isn't as popular, I do think the sort of larger respectability trans femmes that are all about like we're normal we're not freaks like these people like that as a cultural form very much remains um the sort of like young uh not not quite twinkish but you know like the young cross-dressers have become the femboys <laughs> um i could you know just because there's so much to talk about originally i did have a a little slide that kind of talked about like what's the difference between a femboy and a trans woman six months in a therapy letter and then a similar yeah, a similar article uh from a magazine that makes us makes the same point about transvestites into transsexuals where like given enough time a transvestite will become a transsexual woman a woman which i think is a little reductive but i i do think while like the names have changed a lot of the sort of respectability minded stuff has remained especially in terms of like how one needs to perform trans femininity to be properly feminine, to be properly respectable. Again, like the serial numbers have changed and whatnot, but the actual core beliefs I think are still there. Um, this was kind of after my time in terms of transness, uh, you know, becoming a woman, but I have heard of like respect, very toxic respectability minded, like very much body image focus uh, forums or um, I don't quite know what to call them on, on, on 4chan. There's, it's like three T's or four T's or something. Four trans. Four trans. <laughs> and um, so, yeah. And then there's obviously Susan's Place, which is actually still around. Susan's Place was very much a successor to like respectability focused trans femmes in terms of very specific ideas about trans femininity. So like, while this is history, the core sort of ideologies and beliefs, I think are still quite there. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we have time for anyone else. Maybe burning, question, desire, feeling. Yeah. Yeah, so basically what was being advertised, like what was the political economy? So for that, I'll give you a real answer, but the first answer is that is chapter two of my thesis. Um, uh, like my actual thesis is is not, it's kind of like tangentially about what I talked about, but yeah, it is really about like what was being sold and then the ideas that underpin that. So a lot of it is, look at me, normal, like feminine stuff, right? But just like larger size women's shoes, larger size clothing. But then you do have like breast forms to to simulate um, breasts, um, which I had, you know, way back when. Um, you have erotica, which is a big thing. Again, one of the hypocrisies of these groups is that porn is being like, advertised within them it's being sold in sex shops uh, the magazines are being sold in sex, sex shops 
So erotica was a big thing. Um, and then sort of less tawdry, trans feminine goods were being, goods and services were being sold as well. You have personal shoppers, you have like local feminization coaches that are actively advertising themselves. And then in terms of political economy and the question of class, you have lawyers advertising themselves, you have insurance um, being advertised. You actually have trans feminine specific cruises where one could cross dress on the cruise. Um, you have furs being advertised. You have really a range of, um, of fairly expense, like fairly high class consumer goods, uh, which again, I find quite interesting. One of the, um, again, you, you have to publish the thesis eventually, but one of the things I cut, which I found really interesting is that you see the reoccurrence of people not advertising, but people saying that they should have ID cards that basically say like my psychol my psychologist says that I'm normal or my psychologist says that I have, you know, gender identity disorders. So like if a cop were to pull them over, they can whip out their ID card, which I found quite interesting in terms of what that says about their trust in institutions, specifically the police, right? Because if you think the police will take you seriously as an interlocutor or like at least your psychologist, that says a lot about how you sort of view and move through the world, uh, which I find quite interesting. And this, there's more, no, there's like fun stuff too. There's more novel stuff uh, that again, we can see modern versions of. There's a, uh, there's a voice changing phone that you could put over the receiver to give you like a lady voice or a dude voice. Um, there's also, on, th on that note, there's also like phone sex lines, both in terms of like, again, erotica, accessing sex workers, but also just like chat lines where trans times can sort of chat together. There's also a lot of um, catalogs being sold where you could like order trans feminine goods. So just hundreds of pages of like uh, CDs on feminization in terms of like comportment. Comportment's just like is etiquette, like how to walk like a woman uh voice uh, virtually anything again in chapter two i taught there's this long list for yeah how to hold a how to hold a cigarette like a woman continues to come up how to walk how to i know how to talk um virginia prince she publishes how to be a woman though male and i think 1974 where that's one of the big points and also it's both how to talk in terms of like vocal feminization in terms of pitch but also in terms of like the amount of stuff to say and like the topics to say or avoid like she talks of, like she's she says basically to to downplay your intelligence but like us us ladies know that we're secretly smarter than men so like wink wink it's all good so virtually anything she, the most cursed thing you could think of is most likely advertised um in, in these works um yeah and then it's interesting too because like thinking about like modern sex stores where things like dildos weren't really sold within these spaces where you would assume like, oh, it's a sex thing. Like, of course they would sell it. So again, sort of like penetrative, like gay stuff wouldn't be sold, but virtually everything else would. Um, a final sort of curse thing and non, maybe not curse. Again, the, people got a lot out of this was there would be, um, because sometimes people just couldn't shave because of their job. You could buy like latex masks. masks. It would be like, you know, like a full femme woman done in makeup, but you're like, you're wearing a latex face mask, um, full face mask, which I found very, very interesting. Which place? Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> so, let's see this. Okay, yeah, I think we can end there. Thank you again, Chris. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have anything to say? Do you have anything we're supposed to say? No, no. All right. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Nice.